What a pleasure it is to be with you. Thank you, Mr. Fine, for your generous introduction, and thank you all for your dedication to this uh, essential work for mankind, for civilization. You were kind enough to mention some of my own political background. You know, once you're on a city council, you're always on a city council. <laughs> That's the way it is. The other day, my phone rang in the office, and I answered it up here, and uh, there was a nice lady on the other, other end, and she said, I said, hello, this is Jeff Walker, and she said, Jeff, that big black dog is barking next door again. <laughs> I want to do something about that. I said, well, ma'am, I understand. I have had the same problem, and a lot of people uh, experience that, and uh, that's just really difficult and painful, probably keeps you up at night and trying to be empathetic. But you know, I am uh, your United States member of the House of Representatives, under Congressman. That issue is probably best suited to the city council member. And she said, oh, I didn't realize I could go that high. <laughs> Old council member joke. So. <laughs> Thank you again for the kind invitation. You know, I, I saw Julie and, and I and, and our office dialogue fairly frequently, but I haven't seen her in a couple of months, and I saw her outside and said, Julie, you have something to tell me. <laughs> Myself, but you know, you don't ever ask someone or you do or you expect it. And so, uh, congratulations, uh, good to see you. Uh, I'm past that stage in life where the baby in the womb seems to be public property. Have you had people come up and touch you? <laughs> it's, it's an interesting, strange dynamic in our society. You're just going to meet me. But I have five little girls. One of, uh, one of my little girls is social and outgoing, and uh, I asked her the other day, I said, uh, they didn't get to that age where you kind of parent want to kind of shepherd their thinking about what they might want to do in life, and uh, I said, Elizabeth, do you, um, have you ever thought about public service? Would you like to be a politician? She said, no, politics just makes you upset, gets you mad. <laughs> <laughs> Insight for a nine-year-old. <laughs> you had mentioned the Egyptian-Israeli peace accord. Um, I mentioned to you all this, those of you who were here last year, but it was such a formative event for me in 1979 as a young person to actually be in the Sinai Desert uh, and throughout the, throughout Egypt, uh, taking the basic semester of college there. But I was there on the heels of the historic signing of the, of the peace accord. And I'll never forget entering into the Sinai and on, it was this writing in spray paint scrawled upon this twisted pile of rubble and concrete and metal, which is, of course, all too familiar, familiar of the scene now throughout the Middle East. But the words were inscribed, here was the war, here is the peace. And so there was such an atmosphere of celebration in the country at that time being particularly American, people would stop me. And there was a celebration of this weddedness of our country with the Egyptian people. And I assume that was the same in Israel. I didn't travel there at that time. But uh, I'm really happy you mentioned it because the Middle East is a place where we so easily forget and yet we so quickly remember. Uh, thousands of years of memory are offered in terms of the cultural dynamic, and yet we so easily forget the things that actually have worked and are continuing to work to build the capacity for mutual understanding and peace. So it was a, I thought about it being the 30th anniversary of the treaty, and I thought, well, I think it's appropriate to bring some more uh, public attention to that. And I think my colleague, Mr. Delano, who's in the back, joined me as a co-sponsor in that, and we're grateful for that. To continue to remember that which is good, that which has worked, that which seemed impossible, in fact, Diana Tosnati, who's on my staff, is here today. She actually went and got some of the declassified documents from that era, and we read them, the handwritten notes from President Carter uh, to the various leaders at the time. It's really fascinating. I recommend that you do that. And a lot of the same language that we use today was prevalent back then. So we do have a roadmap, if you will, an example of what, what can be done. But clearly, it, it's difficult. It, it seems intractable. Um, and what I fear, frankly, is our time is very short. The reason that I say this is we're standing on the verge of a Middle East that can take two directions. 
One is in a long, hard, narrow, steep way that involves mutual understanding, uh, forgiveness, respect, dialogue on it as to how to appropriately divide things up and live in harmony. Or one in which peoples go their own way, Iran develops nuclear weapons capabilities, leaving the Saudis as to a decision as to what they're going to do in terms of their own defense, cutting a deal with us, cutting a deal with Iran, buying them perhaps on their own, leaving the Egyptians as to a big question as to how they may defend themselves. They can develop it very rapidly, as we all know. Turkey is in part of that equation as well. And then you have, of course, the potential for uh, aggressive proliferation that allows this, this technology to be gotten and be given to them into the hands of those whose ideologies uh, are seem to be bent on uh, the irrational and uh, wholesale destruction of mankind. And the time frame to get this right is narrow. It's, it's more than urgent. It's exponentially urgent. These are existential questions. So, um, I, nobody has a clear answer because you can't control all the external factors in this regard. But that's where we're at, and you all know this. So, I'm just particularly grateful that um, your hearts and are, are willing to focus on this, to pray for the peoples of the Middle East, to bring about public awareness and in the sense of a movement of activism to say we have to get this right, and we have to get it right now. So with that, uh, let me just thank you all. Uh, I wish you the best with your conference today. I understand it's, it's 22 separate uh, denominations and, and confessions here. And that, that's really quite meaningful to me, uh, that you all can come together with a singleness of purpose to focus on this, uh, these most difficult questions. Um, I love the Middle East. I purposefully chose, I'm from Nebraska, I mean, I'm a bit of a heart of our land. It's just wide open, big sky, beautiful prairie, tall grass prairie, um, real slight rolling hills, you just can't even lose your dog out there. You can't see forever. So what, what am I doing working on the Middle East? Uh, well, it, again, as you mentioned, it's part of my own background, but I think ultimately the people of the first district of Nebraska, where I live, even though we're a composite of many small towns and rural areas, uh, a couple of large urban communities, but know in their hearts of hearts that the interdependency now of our entire planet uh, compels us to work very hard with concentrated effort to again develop that mutual understanding, capacities, uh, both in governance as well as in cultures, so that there is a clear direction for goodness, justice, and built upon the foundation of truth so that all people can live lives to reach their fullness of potential. Uh, I think the people back home want me to work on that. Ultimately, that's why they sent me here. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you, and I thank you for your good work, and I thank you for uh, allowing me a few minutes this morning.